Welcome, listeners, to Connect the Dots. I'm Allison Rose Levy, and I'm here with you every Wednesday. Our usual show hour is 10 a.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Radio Network, but tonight we're doing a special broadcast um, because there's just so much that's current to say about the recently re-released film Planet of the Humans. Uh, I'm a longstanding journalist on the environment, health, public policy, food systems, and the media, uh, and this falls into the realm of both environment and media crit- criticism, um, which we'll be discussing with tonight's guest. I am delighted to welcome to Connect the Dots, Ketan Joshi. Uh, he is an analyst and blogger who talks and blogs and considers energy, science, and technology. Um, and he did a really, really brilliant blog, which has gained a lot of notice and attention, um, you know, analyzing this film, its timing, uh, and some of its rather considerable uh, shortfalls, which we'll be discussing shortly. Um, he writes on Medium, The Monthly, The Guardian, uh, and a whole lot of other things. And he's also um, actually uh, at work on a book, um, which he'll tell you a little bit more about. Uh, it's about climate change and Australia's modern climate change story, which as we've seen this past year and at the very beginning of 2020, um, is really another case point uh, in climate chaos. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Welcome to Connect the Dots, Ketan. Hi, it's good to be here. How are you going? Great. Um, we've got a lot going on here in the States, of course. Um, and, you know, I think it's really interesting that in this particular moment where people are sheltering at home, kind of uh, contemplating the prospects of the uh, shutdown and, lock, you know, the basically takeover of our political system, looking at a, um, you know, a, a seriously threatened economy and literally um, hiding at home to, you know, protect our, our lives, uh, which is the case, although some people do dispute that, I think it's a very ripe moment for people to kind of look at some big picture things. Um, and in releasing Planet of the Humans, Michael Moore has, you know, picked a really good time to get people's attention. The question is, uh, is he getting, you know, is he enlisting our attention in this film in a uh, productive and useful way, or is this some kind of distraction or uh, diversion from what we really need to be thinking about? Um, so, you know, let's jump in. And, you know, what do you, you know, how do you look at the film within that that question, that framing? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting framing because the post that I wrote on climate change that I published just before I published this one, it was a couple of weeks ago. And it was about this meme that I was seeing everywhere as a response to the coronavirus pandemic. And the meme goes something roughly like it's a picture of the canals in Venice or it's some dolphins swimming around or it's a street in a normally crowded city that's sort of been repopulated by, by animals. And mm-hmm. the message that tends to go along with those with those pictures and those, and those videos is that nature is somehow sort of healing uh, and that because of social distancing, because people are staying inside and, and, and not sort of populating these outdoor spaces, that is what is curing nature. The, you know, the sort of the earth is returning to some natural sort of state. And then what was happening is those messages were being appended with this idea that the pandemic is an intentional sort of message from, from nature or from earth uh, that is being sent to essentially punish us or, or remind us of the limits of humanity. Uh, and I wrote this post um, a couple of weeks ago, and I sort of linked it to the phenomenon of eco-fascism. Though, sort of, you know, in retrospect, I kind of think maybe that was a bit uh, that was a bit of a clumsy linkage. Uh, but it was just on my mind a lot, and I was seeing it everywhere. And the first thing that I saw. Uh, about this documentary was actually an interview Michael Moore did afterwards uh, and it was published on Reuters and he says something along the lines of well you can kind of see that the air is clean now and that animals are returning to public spaces Uh, so this sort of demonstrates that that 
we're right about what we say, which is basically the root cause of climate change is just too many people. Uh, the, it all boils down to the fact that the number of humans on Earth is, is too large. So, so it's, it's funny that you mentioned that framing because I think that's, that's perfect. I think that the sort of thing that's going around a lot about uh, the coronavirus being illustrative of human folly, of human environmental harm, uh, I think it's a really... You, you can kind of feel the subtext. Obviously, you know, we'll go into it later, but obviously the documentary was made well before any of this happened. Uh, but that being the subtext makes perfect sense for this film. Yes, and actually I heard um, Michael Moore and his uh, colleagues, you know, three white men talking about depopulation, among other things, you know, on Joe Rising. He said the same thing. So, you know, it's like we... Uh, he said, you know, Mother Nature has sent us to our rooms. And, mm. of course, you know, this preys on people's emotional psychology, um, which is, you know, one of my areas of interest and everything. You know, it, we're all feeling bad. We're, we come from a puritanical, guilt-inducing culture. Uh, in fact, we do have a lot of unexamined uh, complicity in global climate change and capitalism and in all the things that are bedeviling us and, and under, you know, undermining human life on Earth. We do have some complicity. Um, but really, truly analyzing and addressing the source of complicity and breaking our social agreements um, to allow or look away or participate in that, um, which I think is very much necessary, um, is a more mature kind of level of uh, environmental concern and understanding than kind of taking this childlike, um, you know, playing on childlike psychology of mommy sent us to our room, um, mm. you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> because we were bad and then kind of making a deal or a bargain. Oh, you know, I will not, I mean, I think it's very good not to purchase plastic bottles or straws. I have carried glass straws with me wherever I go for, for a number of years, you know, and there are other things that we could all look at, but making our individual choices um, accountable in a collective uh, systemic collusion of factors that we have been um, uh, not as dedicated to addressing, let's put it that way, as we might have been, is kind of both reassuring and falsely empowering, and it's kind of an easy fix. Uh, and that was, you know, my, you know, that's my concern when I hear what I consider a, a psychological, indu uh, you know, induction. And also in the same way, the things that you're talking about where I've seen a million of these memes, oh, the coyotes are in the street, at last nature is free, you know, <laughs> it's like we're trying to find an upside, an immediate fix for a systemic yeah. problem. And in the U.S., as well as in Australia, which you're writing about, we haven't ad addressed either of those problems. In fact, we have, in the U.S., some of us have really tried and not been successful and been blocked in addressing the climate problem through electing someone that is not beholden to the fossil fuel companies. But, I'm really yeah, so, so there's an interesting little note there, if, if you like, for, for the U.S. and yep. Australia. Um, so I, I've been, you know, my, my background is, is energy. I, I sort of worked in the renewable energy energy industry from 2010 to 2017 uh, mm. through like government agencies, science agencies and a company and some NGOs. And mm -hmm. um, so I, my, my first instinct is to always kind of think about, OK, you know, what's happening with electricity? What's what's happening in the sector that I kind of know? And mm -hmm. very, very fascinatingly in Australia, there has been very little change in electricity demand as the country has enacted its social distancing policies, whereas in the U.S. there has actually been a much bigger impact. So in the U.S. it's been about 20 percent and in Australia it's been between around 2 and 5 percent reduction in electricity demand. Uh, now, and I think that's, that signifies something really important, which is essentially... If you, I had a little sort of preliminary look into the into the data a couple of days ago, but Australia's uh, a lot of Australia's emissions come from its electricity sector, so that's coal-fired power stations and gas-fired power stations creating uh, greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. and that's probably just not going to change a lot. Uh, and, and the reason is industry has gone down a bit 
residential consumption has gone up a bit and not much has really changed. <laughs> so uh, obviously transport emissions are going down in Australia, the aviation industry and people are driving less and things like that. Um, but I think a lot of people just expected a much bigger impact on particularly electricity emissions because they were like, well, you know, industry is kind of like winding down a bit and uh, businesses are winding down a bit. So surely electricity usage will go down. And, you know, that's sort of the message of the film as well, is that, you know, if we sort of, if we enact these radical changes across our lifestyles, uh, then we're going to see the change that we have been so desperately hoping for. Uh, and mm -hmm. in Australia in particular, it's really just not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, if only it were that simple. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's like the other problem is that with one hand, um, you know, the film appears to be calling into account um, capitalism as a major source of this problem, but in, which, of course, is in fact true, uh, because, you know, our government is entwined and, and you know, prey to and bought by um, major industries, in this case, the fossil fuel industry, in the case of our not having proper health care for people, which has really come to the fore right now. It's the pharmaceutical and health care industries that are um, putting their profit margins uh, above supplying and providing the, the services that are needed or doing performing services, as in the case with the fossil fuel industry, in such a way that they're, you know, creating permanent damage to the entire habitat. Um, so, you know, we can't hold them accountable beca because of the lockdown of capitalism. But then turning around and looking at um, – climate leaders, uh, you know, environmental leaders, and holding them responsible for um, being co-opted during an epoch when everybody was co-opted. The president was co-opted. <laughs> the, you know, administration's energy plans were co-opted. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it's taking it entirely out of context. Um, you know, I'd be curious, like, you know, a lot, when I point out that a lot of the footage was shot before, it was, you know, it, it appears to be dated. It's not clear. In fact, it's clear. It's, it's not clear that the inf from watching the film, you can't tell, is the information current or isn't. Having worked recently in the industry, what's your view? So I, I think people who, not even just people who've worked in the industry, but people who sort of report on energy and climate issues and even people mm -hmm. tangentially familiar with a lot of these technologies and a lot of these uh, issues recognize very, very quickly from the start of the film that it's not just old. It's not just like sort of two or three years old, like, you know, the time it takes to make a documentary. Uh, right. it's, it's about a decade old. And what's happened in the past decade is a lot of change to a bunch of the industries that they talk about in the film. So I'll give, I'll give you uh, an example the electric vehicle industry, um, you know, it opens with this, the launch of the uh, Chevy Volt and, you know, General Motors are not exactly a shining example of the best of cleaning up the transport system. <laughs> I think, like, I, I really, it's definitely chosen to be, uh, I guess, like a bad example. Um, and within the field of these efforts to turn transport into something that is low emissions, um, you wouldn't really start with General Motors, you know, like it's not a fair showing. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they go right back in time to 2010 um, when the grid was significantly, when that significantly higher proportion of fossil fuels was on the grid, um, the development of, of electric vehicles was uh, significantly less advanced. And, you know, so, so since then, you know, batteries are kind of more dense and they're cheaper and um, there are slightly better ways to build those vehicles and there are slightly uh, more environmentally friendly options for not using vehicles at all on the streets to reduce emissions. Uh, so that's that was my key takeaway is the first thing I, I thought in my head was like, why is this so old? Like, it's really strange that it's just so ancient. Uh, if you made the same documentary, but you did it in 2018 or 2019, mm -hmm. uh, then all of the footage would look very different and the things people say would be very different. Um, obviously, just piecing apart what happened there, it's obviously just something that they've been working on for ages. And they obviously just struggled for a long time to get it out. And it eventually reached a point where they were like, well, 
we can't just let this sort of fade off into nothingness. So we kind of just want to get something out. But instead of updating it with sort of current ideas and current thinking, they just released it, released it as it is. Um, and so, you know, the other interesting phenomenon, I guess, that's flowed from the release of the film is that a lot of the people who have written about it or criticized it or expressed support for it are noticing all of these very old phenomena coming up. So, you know, a lot of climate change deny groups, um, a lot of the accounts that post stuff like, mm -hmm. you know, the global warming scam is about to be revealed and all this sort of strange old stuff. Mm -hmm. This that used to that used to be my Twitter feed, you know, back in like 2013 and 2014. You used to see that all everywhere and all the time and in newspapers and you used to see it on TV and like, um, you know, there was a very different attitude towards climate change denial. Like it was really a lot more prominent. People had people didn't really have their guard up about a lot of those messages. Um, and so it's funny how even the reaction to the film has sort of created this rehash of like a decade ago. It's a very strange phenomenon and it's not a very nice phenomenon because I would, I like to imagine that things really changed for the better, um, particularly after late 2019, when you had the emergence of the, um, the youth climate strike movements around the world and the global climate marches that really changed the tone from arguing with people who don't really get the sort of basic facts on this to a much more positive, passionate public message where people mm -hmm. were being encouraged to participate of climate change, you know, sort of move from being this sciencey thing, this sciencey technological thing to this sort of uh, phenomenon of mass public participation. And it's, a, and it's a little bit sad to feel, to sort of see that it's kind of, hopefully briefly and temporarily kind of regressed back into this older era um of you know just bad memes and and strange ideas and and old and old kind of crusty concepts yeah well it doesn't speak well for the film um that it uses older data because they had it and you know maybe they suddenly got funding that enabled them to complete the film for some reason um, you know, I wonder about that, frankly. Um, you know, maybe that's just a, a false or wrongheaded uh, suspicion or something. But, you know, I do wonder about that. But it doesn't speak well that they don't, you know, kind of contextualize it and say this is the epoch when it was done. A lot has evolved since then. Um, there, this was the political economic context at that time. Um, you know, so it's one thing to do history, but it's another th which can be appropriate if somebody wants to watch uh, a film about where things started uh, at the, you know, near the beginning of the renewable venture. But then to jump forward and issue a, you know, a kind of wholesale con condemnation based on where it was then, um, without, you know, that context, that is what to me is very problematic. Um, from a journalistic point of view. And the other problem is, you know, if we, if you or I write a blog, we have to, um, you know, yes, we can give our opinions, but we also have to cite links. We have to document what we're talking about. And, you know, a film is undocumented. It's very emotionally persuasive. Um, and so people, you know, it sounds upsetting and reasonable. And, and many people in the U.S. have kind of, you know, had a problem with or had, had issues with some of the, large environmental organizations. I have. I've reported on them. I've criticized them um, often. <laughs> you know, mm. so it's easy to take our larger disaffection, both from that and more importantly, from the losses in the political field here in the U.S. And then, um, you know, not look at the people who really put in place the energy systems and economic systems to which the environmental groups had to react and dance and try to get some entree. Um, but, you know, just the leadership of that themselves, not that they, you know, played a perfect role. I'm certainly not saying that, but it seems quite faulty to make this great leap to condemn the entire field of renewables without, like, without that, like, for one thing, you know, there is a there is, there has been evolution. There are prospects to go to 100% renewables rather than this compromise um, of things that are basically discredited that the film is critiquing. So to take those faraway things to discredit what is happening, possible, and needs to be done now, 
that's the part that I, I can deal with the fact that they wanted to target Bill McKibben rather than President Obama, for example, who originated the all of the above energy yeah. po- uh, policy, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. is, and, you know, and silently engineering the current election. Obviously, it's easier to target poor old Bill McKibben, you know, for his flaws. But, you know, where does that leave us in going forward to address this? What, so, what do they propose? Yeah, it's it's a it's a very interesting question because I think basically it speaks to a challenge that obviously has existed for a long time, which is how do you do introspection for a movement? How how do you criticize yourself or your friends um, without creating this risk profile? And so what this movie does is is it, it tries to do inwards facing criticism, and I'm and I'm operating on the charitable assumption that when they call themselves environmentalists and leftists, they mean it. Um, mm-hmm. How do you do that without basically triggering the other side in sort of pointing at it and saying, ha ha, see, you know, we told you that renewables were bad and we told you that, uh, you know, environmental groups were sinister. Um, and what they, th- basically the answer to that question is you only do that with extreme care and extreme effort. Um, and you have to come to you have to come to that process of introspection with an extreme level of charity and kindness, and you have to talk to people and you have to listen to people. Um, and I can't that series of words I just said; uh, uh, those are the antithesis of this film. They only talk to each other. They don't put a huge amount of effort into checking anything. So there's a lot of mistakes in the film. Um, and in fact you know, a lot of what I saw in that film is directly borrowed from fossil fuel industry talking points or climate change denier talking points. Um, So what has happened as a consequence of the release of this film is I think almost every single major climate change denial group in the world has been aggressively pushing it. So they've kind of said, you know, you've got to watch this. Um, They're sort of using it as this cross ideological communications tool where they're saying, you're a leftist, you like Michael Moore, you better watch this documentary that by Michael Moore showing that renewable energy, uh, wind and solar are environmentally damaging and run on fossil fuels and all that sort of stuff. So it, what it sort of illustrates is that the way forward um, will necessarily involve um, good, healthy, constructive, inward-facing criticism where you kind of look at something, you look at something that your friends are doing, something that the people you respect and you love are doing and you go okay what's the best way for me to retain this relationship with this person that i have um Mm -hmm. whether it's you know friendship or whether it's just you know you respect them as like a um, leader in a movement um but also criticize them in a way that kind of gets them to pair it back and and you know clean up their act a little bit um and really i think that I, i would say that a lot of the climate advocacy movement is getting pretty good at that. They, they're good at sort of saying, you know, um, that's, that's not really a healthy direction that we're going in or we don't like this particular thing. Um, you know, we don't like, say, you know, the excesses of capitalism deciding the growth of renewable energy around the world. We don't like it when um, large organisations do partnerships with, you know, um, with large environment organisations do partnerships with big banks. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny story, actually, if you like, that sort of relates to this in Australia. um, Australia actually originated um, Earth Hour. Are you familiar with Earth Hour? You know, the in March, you know, sort of people flick off their lights for one hour. Um, They did what? What was it it called? It's called Earth Hour. Oh, no, I haven't heard of that. Yeah. So so what it is, is it sort of originated in Australia uh, as a sort of, uh, it basically, it's a one hour event each year and you sort of turn off your lights in your house to signify your support for climate action. And back in, it started in 2008 and it was really good. You know, it like, it really raised a lot of awareness about an issue that in 2008, people were only sort of hearing like conflicting things about, like it was like some hard science and then some crazy climate deniers and it sort of brought it out into the public and you could participate in it and it was really good. And um, unfortunately what happened is it just really stuck. Um, And eventually, you know, I I felt like the event was sending the wrong message. Um, 
you know, when it comes to stuff like energy efficiency, it's not really so much about turning the lights off as it is about like, you know, building a building a better home so you don't have to buy a 2000 kilowatt air conditioner <laughs> in Australia, mm-hmm. for instance. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there, there are a lot of really great, there are a lot of really great things you can do in energy efficiency that don't involve you turning your lights off. Like, you know, you change your light bulb to an LED bulb. Um, lights are really just not, not massive proportions of consumption in people's homes. Um, mm-hmm. So I wrote it, I wrote this short little blog criticizing Earth Hour um, and sort of criticizing the World Wildlife Fund a little bit for, for um, partnering with this advertising agency, Leo Burnett. Um, and the reason that I criticized them for that is because Leo Burnett, um, and I, I think this is actually still the case, they have um, Philip Morris, the tobacco company, as one of their clients. Um, and I just found that really gross. I was like, that's that's so weird and horrible that this like tobacco advertising company is also doing ads for climate change because um, it just feels so morally bankrupt and a bit icky. And <laughs> I was just like, you know, I, I think it really sucks that they're doing this. Um, and when I wrote that, I was freaking out because I didn't want my blog to be picked up by climate change deniers. Um, mm-hmm. And I knew that they love that sort of stuff. Like they love criticizing Earth Hour, um, and they love, you know, um, they love attacking these environment organizations. But at the same time, I felt like that this criticism was justified, um, and I freaked out for like just weeks and weeks, and I never published the thing. Uh, and then eventually, like a month later, I published it when no one cared about the issue anymore. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, that's the life just my of a writer. I totally get that. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what happened then when you finally published it? No one read it because I, it wasn't very well written. Or, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. So. Or the timing was off. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like making pancakes or something, you know, there's a yeah. moment where it's hot and yet if you're doing some, I mean, our conversation and the, um, program that, uh, broadcast earlier today, which I'll give a little shout out to since I'm talking about it right now, um, an interview with Mark C. Jacobson, who is the principal scientific and engineering architect of the energy plan underlying the Green New Deal. And in that conversation, he basically gives a complete update as to where we are scientifically in terms of what we can accomplish and how long it would take once there was political will to instigate a Green New Deal. Um, and sort of refocus us, us on the bad news that, you know, we have a, a sacrificial lamb of an election here. Um, so that show uh, will be in the Connect the Dots archived, and it aired um, today at 10 a.m., and we're doing the evening program. But, you know, I've taken a lot of flack from taking this stance because a lot of people who are not following events, you know, the, all that closely and in that great detail, or some who are, um, you know, and have noted the problem earlier and really become so concerned about it that maybe they haven't looked as closely as at the newer plans. Um, but, you know, people don't really, they can't do an on, most, the average viewer of a film can't do an on the ground uh, immediate um, analysis of anything that's happening in real time, you know, from this film to, a, you know, a debate. I mean, there needs to be, this is what journalists are for, you know, we need to do uh, fact-checking of the information. And, and But, you know, the but Michael, you know, Michael Moore is a king of emotional enlistment. So people are enlisted mm-hmm. emotionally and, um, and it kind of overwhelms, you know, the cognitive. And then there's a hope that, oh, if we all realize that we are part of the problem, something could be done, you know. But the question is, what could be done, and what will really make a difference? Because he doesn't propose anything. I mean, what do you think are – I mean, I think there that some people – I think the film is a little bit of a – you know, uh, a mirror. In other words, somebody could look at the film and imagine that this is going to happen or that that should happen or, you know, we should all do this or we should all do that. Since none of it is stated in the film, um, you know, there are kind of implications that are floating there and some of them aren't that good. For example, raising the specter of um, depopulation is highly problematic. (laughs) 
That's just yeah, one example. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, I watched the second half of this film very closely because I wanted to pay attention to what the sort of roadmap that it comes up with uh, mm -hmm. would be at the end of the film. Uh, obviously, watching the whole thing, I was like, okay, this is setting up for a... This is setting up to present a pathway for the future. And, of course, it doesn't. Uh, it it right. sort of just raises a bunch of nebulous ideas um, mm -hmm. that, as you, as you rightly say, um, are a little, a little nerve-wracking. Um, you know, I, I, I have... Uh, my background is I'm, I'm Indian. Um, so mm -hmm. my parents uh, grew up in India. Um, I, I grew up in Australia. Um, and so I sort of... These, these arguments about people and population um, all both they feel very relevant because my ancestry is from a country of people who consume very small amounts of energy but are great in number and then I grew up in a country that is that doesn't have very many people but those people consume huge amounts of energy um, <laughs> so I, I was very interested to see which direction they would take it because you can either say, the people who consume too much energy should consume less, or you can say reduce the number of people consuming energy. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, <laughs> of course, like it gets to the end of the film, and they and they go in the there are too many people direction, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, you could probably could have seen that coming from the start of the film, um, but of course, uh, the implicit assumption in that is that that is targeted towards the areas of the world where A, there are a lot of people and B, the number of people is growing at a higher rate. Um, mm -hmm. So that is what I mean. I, I, I'm going to write a follow-up post on this pretty soon um, when I find the time somehow. Um, but basically it's, you know, it, it sort of links in with a bunch of ideas around um, developing countries having uh, their population, the rate of population growth curbed and they're kind of gross, and I don't like them. Um, but basically, it's not it's not my wheelhouse. Uh, my my area of expertise is is energy, and climate. Um, so I should just go to the. You sort of asked um, what what's the pathway forward? Like, what's a good way to go from here? And you mentioned the Green New Deal, um, mm -hmm. and it's something I've been reading about. It's a, but it's quite an unfamiliar concept to somebody who comes from Australia because you don't really see climate action framed as energy justice or fairness or um, mm -hmm. equity very much. Uh, e even mm -hmm. now, you know, a lot of Australia's key climate advocates talk about the economic prowess that you would get if Australia became a clean energy superpower. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, that's, I think that's really important because it means that people are still thinking about economics they're still thinking about money and about abundance yes. uh even when they're thinking about the development of an energy transition uh mm -hmm. and and the problem with that argument that it that just keeps coming up again and again particularly in a country like australia is that it's not a sustainable argument people stop seeing any real personal connection with climate action so I don't sort of mean that in the sense that um, growth is bad or that a bit big economy is bad or anything like that. Of course, those are all valid arguments in their own way when you sort of pick them apart. But I mean it purely from the sense of how do people feel about climate action? Like, what's the vibe? What's the sort of emotion that they mm -hmm. that they experience when they think about it? Um, mm -hmm. And at the moment, there's not a huge amount of connection to it. Uh, generally in Australia, you know, a wind farm is this sort of huge construction that's off in some rural area. 7% um, of Australia's energy comes from solar power. That's been really, uh, sorry, from rooftop solar power, just to be specific. Um, and that is actually a great example of where people have taken climate action that they can personally relate to, but it's not really equitable because it only applies to people who have a rooftop um, and a very large proportion yeah, of, of Australians live in yeah, apartments. Right. And, yeah, and, you know, not everyone can afford to put rooftop solar on their, on their roofs. That's so right. um, uh, what's going to happen this year is that basically the language of American climate action, um, which is, you know, sort of what AOC has been talking about, Bernie Sanders, um, Mark Jacobson, um, a lot of that stuff is hopefully going to translate into Australia's debate where uh, people start thinking a lot more about an equitable transition. Um, and I just want to tie it back to something you said earlier, because they, they sort of, um, this comes up a lot in the documentary. They talk about 
capitalism and Wall Street and banks and big dollar signs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And there is actually a really interesting little element of truth underneath a lot of this. Um, and it sort of relates back to my experience in the clean energy industry because I worked at a, I worked at a, at this company and we built wind farms out in, in rural areas and sometimes it went fine. You know, um, generally those, those projects, they tended to be quite far away from where people lived. Um, they were, they really were just away from all human life. Um, but other projects were quite close to communities. And what happened with a lot of those projects is that there wasn't really a lot of flexibility to sort of adopt the needs of the community. And there wasn't a whole lot of listening going on. And, you know, um, when you're in a company, people talk about shareholders, they talk about investors, you sort of talk to each other in within the walls of an office. And you don't spend as much time talking to the community as you should. Um, and so what what that really sort of kicked off in me was this journey of learning about community energy. Um, and I sort of talk about this a lot in my book, but one of the best, most sustainable pathways for the growth of large scale clean energy at, at, at a scale that you need to sort of power um, an economy, whether that's an economy of less people or more efficient consumption or all those, all those sorts of things, you still need something. Um, and really um, these developments, and you see them a lot in Germany and Denmark, that are basically owned by communities. So uh, you, mm -hmm. you do have some partial ownership from corporations and corporations do run the process of construction and development. But what happens is the is the um, the revenue of these sites goes back into communities directly. Um, then you get a much healthier and a much more sustainable way of growing the industry over a long period of time. And part of that is because people experience it. They know they you know, they own a bit of that facility. They own part of the solar panel or part of the wind turbine. Um, it doesn't have to be those two technologies. You can have a bunch of different options as well. It doesn't even have to be technology. You know, you can, you can have these community energy options where people own a, a utility. Uh, so, that, so it's a sort of a community owned corporation that purchases power from places that they find suitable to their community needs. Uh, so all of these options, uh, I think they've really developed over the past decade. And the whole time I was watching Michael Moore's documentary, um, I, I barely mentioned this in my blog post because I felt like I just didn't have the time to properly get into it. But the whole time I was sitting there thinking about how come he's not speaking to any community owned um, solar plants or community owned wind farms or the people who, who live near these projects and how they feel about them and how you can actually realize these technologies without the added problems of like, for example, a, a corporation clumsily sort of like bulldozing its way through a community. Um, that really stood out to me because w what it means is that the problem isn't inherent to the structure of a wind turbine or the shape of a solar panel. Like there's nothing inherent in those machines that means that they have to be financed by like, big banks or, you know, they need to be done in, in like conjunction with like fossil fuel companies or anything like that. Um, you can actually shape the transition into something that is far healthier and far more sustainable. Um, and it's a lot of hard work yeah. to learn about this stuff. It took me yeah. ages. Yeah. And I don't think they put well, that, that hard work. Well, that is also in. part of what the Green New Deal was proposing to do because, you know, a part that, uh, you know, I mean, in talking with the engineering side of the proposition, you know, the lead uh, uh, environmental engineer on this, uh, as I, you know, a, a in the earlier broadcast, um, you know, we didn't get into this dimension of it. But, of course, as shaped uh, in the U.S. under the Green New Deal rubric by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, there was a, you know, a, a huge sweep toward environmental justice. There were multi-tiered levels so that, you know, at the federal level there would be investment going into um, developments that were on a, you know, society, you know, to the society-wide grid, but then also on local levels where, you know, the energy would be used as well as uh, gathered from sun, wind, and geothermal and other things. All of that was actually a whole other articulation of the implementation 
of the plan and the way it would also economically um, benefit um, the businesses, the small businesses and the communities who were, um, as you state, perhaps cooperatively developing it. But I think it's that component of the um, – of the Green New Deal that, um, although it did have wide support in the U.S., something like 60% of the population was in favor of it. But I think there were other people who were confused by the um, the social justice um, add-ons to it uh, and therefore and didn't get the message about the actual um, – you know, the technical side and the way that this would solve our climate problem if implemented. Um, and so then that leaves somebody like Michael Moore, who is talking about 10-year-old technologies and 10-year-old footage, you know, to get into the nitty-gritty of a bygone and rejected technology and say, you know, which, you know, has been in use in all fairness. So it's, you know, there is some legitimate historical criticism, but it's not historically, it's casting a shadow on what's available currently, which people are not aware of. And, and I, I'm wondering if um, perhaps racism and, uh, you know, the tendency to invisibilize, uh, di you know, disadvantaged populations, which, you know, Bernie Sanders' campaign and the Green New Deal w was really inclusive and embracing um, toward kind of masked the actual technological achievements that will make a transition possible so that, you know, white, um, more privileged people see, you know, uh, Moore's film and they relate to, oh, I could reduce my consumerism, <laughs> you know, not really realizing that we could be heading toward austerity um, economically now, and it might be a belt tightening for them, but it might be uh, suicidal for other populations. So that's, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective um, on that, as well as the overpopulation um, question, which you're, you know, really, if you could speak a little bit more to both things, because, you know, I just s feel like who is this film speaking to, and what is it enlisting them to when, you know, you actually see that the science is there for us to do what we need to, but somehow overpopulation is being put to the forefront and, um, the, you know, with the, the idea that austerity is good for us um, in, a, uh, in a way that will be more punishing to the disadvantaged. Yeah, it's a it's really a, a pretty major cop out in in my eyes because you know the, <laughs> the way the way that the the film is constructed is it sort of knocks away every alternative on extremely weak justifications, right? So so for instance, uh, when they talk about solar, um, they've got a guy on there who's who's just sort of saying, well, you need fossil fuels to make a solar panel, and then it just kind of stops, and it's like, well, that's not an option then like you can't looks like we can't use solar panels to resolve the climate crisis because you need fossil fuels to make it um so so what's going on there um is this sort of binary thinking right it's a zero or it's a one either climate change is fixed or it's not fixed uh you can't reduce emissions by 99 percent uh in their view so you can't you kind of like if a solar panel requires one ton of carbon emissions to make but it offsets a thousand tons over its lifetime then that still counts as a failure um now <laughs> if you sort of trace that binary thinking through mm. as an overarching ideology when you apply it to the entire climate change problem you can mm. kind of see how they get to where they get to which is that there is no action or change to the human species that could ever result in lower emissions. Um, so you just have to, you just have to kind of chop off this limb of humanity. And, and that's the only way you can do it is to, is to remove. And of course, you know, if you reduce the population by, by 50%, you would still have 50% of our current level of, of carbon emissions going into the atmosphere. Uh, and of course, you wouldn't be able to build any new technologies to replace the fossil fuel ones because by their reckoning, all those technologies are, are envir as environmentally damaging as the fossil fuel power stations anyway. 
so you, the more you think about the more you think about what they're saying in this film the more you end end up going in this strange maddening circle inside your own mind uh, and it's a real problem because a lot of people are watching it and walking away feeling refreshed and satisfied and changed by it and i don't and i'm having trouble relating to what they what they take from it um but from what i can see it links back to this phenomenon that has been cropping up here and there over the past year and it's sort of around giving up uh okay. and it's it's been referred to as as doomism i'm not sure if you've okay. you sort of heard that phrase no. uh do sorry yeah Doomism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this sort of like doom and gloom approach, which is essentially uh, that there is no real change that we could ever make that that would resolve this problem, right? So um, really, the the math is relatively simple. Um, we need to bring emissions down to zero. Uh, we need to do it as quickly as possible. And and every little unit of change that we make results in fewer quantities of, of greenhouse gases in the planet's atmosphere and consequently mm-hmm. a lower chance of negative impacts on human life. Uh, but the the film just kind of, like, I, I don't quite understand where it's going except in the context of this sort of nihilistic, anti-human idea that it is purely our existence no matter what we do, no matter what changes we make, no matter how we live our lives, not even really, and no matter how much we consume, we will cause this problem. Um, and that's why, you know, just to bring it back to what we talked about at the start of this conversation, all those articles about, um, you know, animals returning to the canals of Venice or whatever, mm-hmm. they, yeah. they always came with the phrase, humanity is the virus. Um mm-hmm. And I feel like that's a really, I feel like that's just such a significant little thing to say, because if humanity is the virus, then the only cure is eradication, right? Like there's no, you you can't, you can't say to a virus, just change your ways, just make it better, you know, (laughs) just do something differently. Mm -hmm. Um, Just figure out a nicer way to live that doesn't screw up so many people's lives. Uh, virus is just like this automatic destructive force that has no agency. Um, and if you talk to young climate activists, if you talk to a lot of people in the movement, if you listen to Greta Thunberg's speeches, it is always really about agency when you, when you break it down. There's a frustration at the heart of it, which is that stop pretending that you don't have any control. Stop pretending that you don't have the power to fix this. Um, and get your stuff together because you actually do have the power to fix this. You've kind of just been seized by this like phenomena of widespread inaction for three decades. And it is actually not as hard to, to fix as you, as you think it is, as you would have, you know, sort of discovered in your, uh, as you would have explored, sorry, in your, in your earlier conversation. Um, it's not, it's not as terrifying or as life changing or as existential as you sort of been, feeling in your heart for a long time um but the barriers are difficult the 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 stuff that's in the way that's in between us and the solutions that's the hard yeah. part you know the that's the right. fossil fuel industry's impact on yep. politics or or like you know yep. um the difficulty of just switching a grid from one technology to another technology um th- those things are hard but but they're resolvable there's nothing inherently unsolvable about them so that is my read on why people are watching this film and kind of walking away feeling like, yeah, you know, I knew it. I knew that there was no way to fix this. I knew that humanity was sort of inherently cursed and and it would never be able to figure out a a solution for this. And it's very much not what you will hear from young climate activist groups like the Sunrise Movement, um, the Australian Mm -hmm. Youth Climate Coalition in Australia, for instance. Um, Mm -hmm. It's really not the message that you hear from them. They're, They're screaming out, you, you can actually do it. Stop, stop freaking out. Stop giving up. Um, this is the pathway. We know what to do. Yes. I mean, people were saying to me, asking me on some of these threads where there were a lot of arguments, and basically there are a lot more people who um, 
supported the film and regarded it as like you know a huge breakthrough of some kind um than not you know it on this particular thread for some reason it was i just was kind of really surprised by it but that was what was happening and some people asked well where are the sunrise movement and of course you know I look to that immediately to double check my own perspective, you know, and, and they're, they're basically, you know, on with trying to get things happen in government, even under the most difficult circumstances. They're still engaged. They're still fighting for what needs to happen. They're fighting for economic support for people who are suffering from the pandemic and, and, and uh, lack the wherewithal to uh, economically persist, you know. So they're on the forefront of that. They're not um, thinking about their concerns consumer purchases or writing this off. I mean, so to me, this is a great opportunity to really um, revisit the Green New Deal. And if people weren't able to perceive it because of um, their prejudiced overlays, let's just say, because that's not maybe who everybody wants to be or is in their heart of hearts, um, you know, like, I think it's a great time to actually look at the possibility of, rather than just um, take these earlier setbacks, which were endemic to our entire country because they represented government policy and still do. And in fact, we're reelecting the same policy that we're condemning the you know, environmental groups for, for, from dancing with in earlier years. And they were dancing with those because that per, was the economic context. We're beginning to see that there could be perhaps a different economic context. We haven't caught up with that politically yet to really enact that. And I think there were many people who were holding back from really pushing for that because they didn't realize that a Green New Deal that could, as, you know, I've learned, you know, recently from this revisiting of it, could in 10 years reduce 80 percent of the problem in 10 years if we instated it. If we began in, you know, 2021, it would happen by uh, 2030, and instead, in the shadow of that blockage by the very parties that are um, in bed with the fossil fuel companies and are going along with it, we are f preventing that from happening, and his film is implying that, you know, we could... Um, uh, you know, buy less food containers or, you know, drive less or do this or that, or those who can, can afford one could purchase, you know, an existing, I don't know what his solutions are actually. So we're, we're basically, instead of it really making our choices clear, and this is what, you know, the American populace either voted against or were cheated out of, depending on how you want to look at it. So, what you know, the real introspection should be what part did each of us play in that, honestly. So that's my hobby horse about the whole situation. <laughs> and I'm worried about this population aspect, because usually I hear that argument out of the mouths of some of the most privileged people I know. Um, and, you know, then it becomes a question of who decides, and that becomes a kind of globalist overrule question, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I think I think the I think what happens a lot is people talk about it, they, they sort of put forward their ideas about it, they, they receive some backlash, and then and then they always kind of feel a bit taken aback, and they're like, how come I'm not allowed to talk about population? How come you're trying to silence people talking about population? But what, what is really happening there is that to talk about this issue needs to be done with incredible care and caution. And again, a lot of effort, a lot of listening, um, a lot of charity. But unfortunately, the argument kind of comes from people who just aren't good at that. They're used to basically sort of existing in this world where they can just admit their feelings without really putting much effort into, into trying to hear from other people or, or grow them over time. Uh, and consequently, they sort of have this reaction of like, oh, no one lets me talk about this issue, but now I need to get it out. Now I need to get the truth out into the open. And I really think that that is what has happened with this film. Mm, mm hmm mm hmm So it's servicing that, and we'll, I guess, see what, if anything, comes of it, uh, you know, and whether that genie can also be put back in the, in the bottle. And I'm hoping... I'm looking forward to reading your upcoming blog 
um, you know, in order to uh, get a handle on that, because I think it's very important for that to be addressed. Um, the Leah Stokes blog that she did recently, she being an a, a, a environmental professor, author, academic, and kind of thought leader, um, you know, was, was castigated as racist uh, in raising that issue. And, you know, I think it's quite important to raise you know, raise it, and I look forward to your formulation of it. Um, just, you know, saying parenthetically, we're kind of coming down to the last five minutes of the show here. I'm talking with Keitan Joshi, who has been uh, active in the energy, technology, and communications aspects um, of, you know, our environmental movement and we're globally and with special work in Australia um, and you know we've been discussing his recent blog as well as uh, about the film Planet of the Humans um, by Michael Moore and so if you uh, have joined this conversation uh, late uh, this show uh, will be available in the Connect the Dots archive uh, within a day um, and you can share it on social media also uh, an earlier program on um, what the Green New Deal is actually offering us in terms of a, an energy solution is uh, also in in the um, in the archives and rec and recommended listening um, so you know any final thoughts uh, fr from from you Katen about um, you know I mean, how to kind of redirect some of the energy uh, that has been directed toward this film but that may be less than optimal. Yeah, so this is the, that, that, that exact question is the sort of justification for my, uh, all the follow-up work I'll be doing, which is basically uh, often through my, through my career, when some really widely viewed piece of misinformation comes out, often the best thing that you can make out of it is actually using it as a chance to communicate some science and talk about, you know, what the scientists are saying about an issue or what, what technologists or engineers are saying about an issue. Uh, so hopefully I'll, I'll be kind of doing a bit more of a state of play for modern energy, at, you know, sort of looking at some oh, of the great. huge challenges that are coming up in the 2020s, um, particularly around like grid integration and issues around equity, equitable development of, of energy. Um, I guess the other thing is is just simply that uh, it's so tragic that this has come in a year when the climate movement already took a really huge hit. Um, obviously, a pandemic is not great for a movement that was building up so much great momentum from mm -hmm. getting out on the streets and pounding the pavement yeah. and, and, you know, doing strikes and marches and things like that. Um, right. And it just sucks so much it, that yeah. this film has removed, has taken up a lot of oxygen in a, in a debate that should really be focused on what happens after the pandemic, where, where stimulus funding goes, where recovery money goes. Yeah. Um, so really, I, I'm kind of really keen to get back into we're, what my writing currently focuses on. I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I really, we're going to have to end, unfortunately, a little early here, but I really look forward to, and I will be sharing on social media, um, what you're writing. And can you just quickly give your website for people and then who want to read your your material as it comes out, and then um, we'll, we'll kind of sign off. Sure. Uh, my website is katanjoshi.co. That's K-E-T-A-N-J-O-S-H-I.co. And my Twitter handle is at katanj0. Great. Thank you so much, Katan Joshi, for being with us on today's Connect the Dots. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the special edition of Connect the Dots. And uh, you can find it and share it in social media uh, from the Connect the Dots archives. And I look forward to seeing you on next week's show, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, on Wednesdays. I'm Allison Rose Levy. Be well. Well, 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 well